Well, it's part of our ongoing mission here at Right Angle to keep you appraised on the latest developments in the movement to make the future great again. And uh, the holy grail of hypersonic travel may have arrived, and strangely enough, it's coming to us from Venus. Hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott. Gentlemen, I can remember very clearly as a young whippersnapper in seventh grade, uh, finishing my reading assignment for the week in about, oh, I don't know, public schools in Miami at the time. I think it probably took me about 20 minutes. We had something called independent study where we got to go to the library and research books and stuff. And that's when I first heard the expression of a turbo ram rocket aerospace plane, which I thought was melodious. Um, there is a company out there called Venus Aerospace that has produced and test fired the holy grail of hypersonic flight. And the problem is this. The engines you need to fly slowly are very different than the engines you need to fly very, very quickly. And what that has usually meant is you have to carry two engines, which is just plain dumb. It's just yeah. dead weight and stupid, and there's no real, no real solution to that. Half of them are dead flight. weight for well, half the time. Venus yeah. Aerospace, I think based in Houston, let me put on my cogitation spectacles here for a moment, um, <laughs> has produced something that they call, and I really like the sound of this, it's got a, got a kind of a 21st century sort of twang to it. They are introducing the Venus Detonation Ramjet. It's a rotating detonation system. Yes. Ro rotating knives in the abattoir. Uh, <laughs> but I have a, I have a, uh, guys, I have a, a hard and fast rule about anything that comes from uh, the future. If, if there's nothing but computer graphics, I'm not showing it. I, I, I spent a lot of time in the golden age of experimental aviation in the 90s when I saw uh, computer graphics for the most amazing airplanes that never flew. But this, as you can see, is actually working. And uh, based on this particular animation that you're looking at now, you can see that by changing the position of the nozzle spike, this one engine, it's essentially a rocket engine, has to be because it's going to operate in space where there's essentially no atmosphere, is able to reconfigure itself to suck in air at low level, then change its perspective when you get up into the stratosphere. Finally, you get a spike that fits inside the nozzle at Mach 5, and then you just basically go from point A to point B in two hours, and point A and point B can be about as far away as, as you want. Wow. Uh, Steve, I don't know yeah. if you feel this, this way. I do. When Donald Trump was elected in uh, 2024, I felt that the future had been unchained. I think that's probably the best way I can put it. Did you ever get that sense? I really did. Uh, we had four years of of. Uh, he who shall not be named. I'm so sick of that guy. Uh, we had f we had four <coughs> years of him imposing more top-down control from Washington than we'd seen in any four-year term, except possibly for FDR. Just pick one of his terms. Uh, and it was crushing in terms of spending. It was crushing in terms of regulation and crushing in terms of debt. But mostly what it does, and we've seen this in Europe, we talked about this on the backstage show for members of BillWhittle.com, it's crushing of innovation. They, they've crushed out innovation in Europe. Uh, the Democrats were working real hard to do it here for four years with all of these top-down controls. And unleashed, did you say unleashed or unchained? Unchained. Either one works. Either, either one works, because that's what it is. This is, uh, this is Prometheus, you know, pulling his chains out of the rock. This is... Uh, this is a big deal. This, it, it, you know, it's those animal spirits that uh, uh, Keynes talked about that that move the economy. If if you chain those animal spirits, not much happens. You you get a lack of innovation. You get just, well, you get the Soviet Union in the nineteen seventies yeah, right. and eighties. It's it's awful. It's a terrible way for human beings to live, and. To just hear this description of this engine, I've, I haven't seen the thing yet. I'm, as soon as we're done here, I'm getting on YouTube and I'll find this, or you can send me the link, whichever works. Rotating detonation ramjet. I just, oh, I just oh. like the sound of that. Yeah. Right. Oh. What they've done is they've figured out the swing wing of engines. Yep. And that's remarkable. For viewers who don't know what a swing wing is, uh, uh, airplanes with, with wings that stick straight out have a lot of lift. They can get a lot of stuff up in the air, and that's that's great. The problem is they're not very maneuverable and they're not very fast. No so, drag. Yeah, so if you want to, say, get an F-14 off of a carrier deck with a lot of missiles on it, a lot of Phoenix missiles on it, because those are big-ass oh. missiles, and you need a lot of lift. But if you want it to actually be able to fight, it is a fighter, 
you need a lot of maneuverability. And so the solution were, was swing wings. They, they, they tuck back in for flight and they come back out for, for landings and takeoffs. And so you get the best of both worlds. Well, there's added complexity, of course, added, a little added weight. But the compromise is worth it when you're talking about carrier operations uh, or, or for big bombers. Uh, like the uh, B one, uh, yeah, the B one or the or medium bombers like uh, like the F one eleven, so that that's a, that's a worthy compromise. When you're talking about a hypersonic, there just didn't seem to be a way to get that compromise without having one engine that's dead weight half the time and the other engine that's dead weight the other half of the time. If these guys have actually solved this problem, Bill, the world just got a hell of a lot smaller. Yes, it did. And I like the idea of being able to fly. I've flown from the longest flight I ever took is Los Angeles to um, Bangkok, and that was eighteen hours. And and doing that in two. Oh two, yeah, that's touching less than, the edge of less, space. That's less than L.A. to Dallas. Um, uh, Scott, uh, you'll be pleased to know we don't just have that one story. We have another, and this one's kind of interesting. Uh, this one is unfortunately just uh, computer graphics at the time, but there's something about that that I really like. There's a company, I think it might actually be a British company called Pulsar uh, Fusion, and they've unveiled a vision for what they call their Sunbird nuclear rocket. Now, the nuclear rocket is um, is uh, able to get us to Mars at about half the time because basically a specific impulse is a matter of how much energy the you can get out of a pound of fuel or propellant or whatever the case may be. And nuclear rockets are probably twice as efficient or more than uh, than chemical rockets. But the thing I like about this, and I'm breaking my rule about about uh, uh, pixelware, you know, uh, and yeah. vaporware. Vaporware. But yeah. the thing I like the thing I like about this is <clears throat> from from their model, as you can see here from their their sales model, they're not building rockets. They're building engines, and these engines basically go out to existing <coughs> vehicles and attach themselves onto the back of this thing, and it's just like putting an outboard motor on the back of your canoe, you know. And and the next thing you know, man, you are you are hauling butt throughout the solar system. So all of this stuff, as Steve pointed out, was restricted because of the because of the idea of regulation. Mm. It's not like we can't build this; it's just you're not allowed to. Yeah, you mustn't. <laughs> mustn't you one know, one mustn't i think uh most people probably don't have a full appreciation for how much of what currently flies um was actually the result of kids growing up reading science fiction books and thinking they could make that happen absolutely and um and so it's really exciting to see this kind of thing where people uh, imaginations are unleashed i just watched a a 60 minute uh 60 minutes piece with the ceo of anderil we've talked about anderil several times before on this show. And he said something uh, during the course of that interview that I thought was fascinating. He said, we don't want to be a defense contractor. We want to be a maker of military products. And the woman who was interviewing him from 60 Minutes says, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, defense contractors uh, develop things that they say that they can do using taxpayer money, according to government specifications. We want to build things that we know how to make and uh, that we'll, we think will perform with excellence in in the battle space. And uh, we don't want to make the taxpayer pay for our development costs. We just want to sell the products to uh, U.S. and allied governments. And I was like, that's brilliant. Like, why haven't I heard that before? And they are that's making- That's America. That's yes. like and, pre-Cold uh, War America. And then the, the interviewer was like, well, you know, don't you, how can you feel this way? Like, this is a guy who kind of walks around wearing Hawaiian shirts. He wears a mullet. Uh, you know, he's got this weird little jazz beard coming down the middle of his Filthy chin. Filthy hippies. Yes. And, uh, and they're saying, well, you know, don't you feel horrible about the kinds of things that could be done with these weapons? And he said, no, I feel horrible when we send our boys and girls overseas to be killed in foreign wars. I would rather the U.S. and her allies have the ability to uh, disarm people and destroy their capabilities at a distance so that we don't have to send our kids over there. And that kind of thing never happens. And uh, just incredibly eloquent. So this guy at Anderil and, and his whole team are developing these these fascinating things that can do mm-hmm. m- just amazing technology because their dreams are not leashed to the federal government and the procurement process and the development cycles that last forever and the changing leadership in political offices and the Pentagon leaderships that comes and goes and has different priorities. They are focused on making the best products they can to keep American boys and girls uh, safe and in the United States. And the same thing uh, what you're talking about here, this idea that's saying, look, I'm not waiting around for government to tell me what they need me to develop. I'm dreaming and then making it and then saying, hey, anybody want one? 
Hey, Venus. Uh, you know, I, I, whenever we do stories like this, and I try and do them as often as I can mm-hmm. when, they, when they seem to be credible other than just, you know, when, when somebody's actually looks like they're actually going to pull it off. And, and I look back at, at the majority of my life uh, from the time I was a little kid at, you know, age four or five. And, and, and so I grew up during the space age and, and watched all that all the way up to the, to the not just to the Apollo 11 mission, but to the last of the lunar missions in December 72 with Apollo 17. From that point forward until about the time when um, Elon Musk first flew the Falcon Heavy, I, I have watched the entire prime of my life disappear into the uh, stagnancy of a history that's not moving anywhere. And for most of my life, and especially in the latter part when I've started to see things really moving again, I looked at that big hole in the middle of my life that where nothing happened in terms of genuine progress as just like a like a giant abyss of nothingness. But now I think more and more what what I was actually witnessing was the compressing of a spring that mm. energy was was being built up and stored and 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 frustrations building and and people continuing to think about things even though they couldn't build them because of our own self-imposed limitations. And what it feels like now with the election of Donald Trump, we remember clearly just just less than a year ago where the job of NASA was to delay the Falcon, uh, rather, the the job of NASA was to delay the next Starship launch for as long as possible because Elon Musk was uh, was coming out in favor of Donald Trump. You know, when 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 the self-imposed shackles are released, you know, what it's like it's exactly like it's exactly like watching the clamps that hold a rocket down. Uh, release. You, you, you don't release the clamps and then fire the engines. You fire the engines, you get yeah. those babies up to full <clears throat> throttle, and when she's about to take the pad with her, then pff, you let them go, and up she goes. And and that's what this feels like. So I love bringing stories like this. I love the idea that a turbo ram rocket aerospace plane is, is, is now a feasible operational uh, uh, achievement with a with a rocket that actually, uh, rather with a jet rocket that actually burns and, and does the job, I love the fact that nuclear uh, rockets are back on the table again, and you can just bolt one onto the space station and send it out to Jupiter if you want to. And I especially like the fact that we are no longer uh, limited by by weenies who are telling us what the future has to look like from from a uh, position that calls itself progressivism, but is about nothing but regression to the Stone Age and 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 taking out of us that single spark that separates us from every other animal on the face of the earth. And that is not only our imaginations, but our ability to, to be able to build things that we could see in our head. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time right here on Right End.